This panel is about peer-to-peer uh, -peer, peer -peer accommodation of the future of travel. Um, please uh, welcome Magali Boisseau Besseril, who is the founder of Pedicasa. An applause for Magali, please. Thank you. Uh, Debbie Worsko, Worsko um, founder of uh, lovehomeswap.com. An applause for Debbie, please. Juanjo uh, Rodriguez, uh, founder of Knock.com, the airplane for Knock. And uh, Olivier Grémillon, who's a country manager for uh, France, Belgium, and Morocco for Airbnb, unless he has a new title. Okay, we'll talk about that later. Um, so uh, this panel is about so uh, the future of travel. We have uh, two uh, players in the home swapping industry business and, and two players in the peer-to-peer -peer accommodation uh, sectors. They will uh, introduce themselves in two, three minutes and give a bit of um, uh, insights on their vision of the future of travel, peer-to-peer -peer accommodation, and, and maybe cardiff consumption. We already talked um, before, before the panel, and it's interesting to see that uh, probably because of their uh, different uh, nationalities, they have they might have different perspectives. So it will be interesting to share with uh, with the audience. What I suggest for this panel, maybe I should uh, tell everyone the the hashtag Etienne. Yes. For those of you who have 3G, so the hashtag is um, We Share Fest. And the other one is... Uh, What's Fest? Sorry? It's called Cons here. It's Fest called Cons? I'm not sure. Okay, okay. Use We Share Fest if you want to tweet uh, during the panel. Um, so we're, we're going to, to uh, discuss what the future of travel might be, uh, how the, the travel industry might be redefined by uh, sharing and we will also discuss the, the economic and social implications of this booming uh, industry. And if some of you have questions related more to entrepreneurship and how to build a startup in the sharing economy uh, sector, please ask them uh, at the end. I suggest that we discuss all together for 30 minutes. They might discuss uh, all of them uh, together as well. And after 30 minutes, I will take uh, questions from, from the audience. Uh, but before we start, I suggest that you all introduce yourself for two minutes. Uh, maybe Olivier, you can start. No, Megan, you should start. You're a your woman. <laughs> Thank you, Antonin. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Magali Boisseau Becerril. Uh, I'm the CEO of Bedicasa. Uh, Bedicasa is a community uh, booking platform for, for homestays around the world. And I created Bedicasa uh, on my uh, address book in 2007 uh, that has increased in power. And um, at that time, I proposed um, my friend to uh, rent out their rooms. There were uh, hundreds of them in 60 countries. And uh, now we, have, we are 120,000 uh, members in, in Bedicasa. And uh, the aim, uh, the, the uh, main objective um, of Pelicasa is really to uh, put the human uh, at the heart of the system. Um, so at first it was to um, make extra money for uh, my friends and then it, it got bigger and bigger and now it's, um, it's, it's true that everything has been based on the community at Pelicasa. Thank you very much. I'm going to pass Debbie. Hi, I'm Debbie Wasco. I'm the founder of Love Home Swap. Our site is a site where homeowners can swap or rent their homes with other homeowners around the world in order to holiday and save money and have an unhotel experience. Uh, I launched the site a couple of years ago. We had 250 homes on it. Um, and we're now 45,000 and growing in 150 countries around the world. Um, we recently launched rentals three weeks ago. Um, prior to that, our site was based on an online dating model, so free to list your home, 
and you pay to message other members to discuss swaps with three different levels of membership. What we discovered about our core base, and it would be really interesting to talk a little bit about audience and how we see audience behaving, um, but I think, suspect, we're at least a decade older than the average Airbnb. -er. So we tend to skew towards families, empty nesters and second homeowners who want to swap or indeed rent from people like them. And I think another interesting topic to discuss is this blend of swapping and rentals and currency and a lot of the ways that people are starting to think differently about paying for their travel. We have launched rentals, which has been a big hit based on you know 10 days worth of data um, because people were doing it anyway. And I think what we're finding from collaborative consumption and how it impacts upon our business is if you create a community and you create a marketplace and people feel that they can trust the people that they're engaging with through your site, then they're happy to do a whole range of things with them. So our business model is changing and innovating to match the behaviour of consumers who are growing to trust our community. Hello, I'm uh, Juan Rodriguez, I'm um, Spaniard. And as Magali was uh, saying before, the idea of founding NOC, which is also a home swap uh, community, came from uh, my own ex personal experience. I used to do home swapping for a few years, and then it came a point where I decided that it was too good an idea to be executed so poorly on the internet. So we thought there was uh, some place to create a much better system. And then we, we began, and now together with, uh, with our home swap, we are basically the ones who are leading the market to make it grow and make it a much better experience for the users. And uh, one funny point is that uh, everybody in the, in the space now is looking at what Airbnb is doing because obviously they are quite a few uh, steps ahead of anyone. But when we started, we didn't even know that the Airbnb existed. The, the growth has been so, so impressive. I agree with David that the, there are quite a few differences between the rentals and the swap systems both on the moments that you use them and the people that are using them. And I think that's a very interesting topic to discuss afterwards. Um, so, so maybe I'll start with, uh, you know, with, with this. You know, there is always uh, some discussion with Magali on who started first between Billy Casa and, uh, and Airbnb in 2007. So, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very young industry. I think we are still only at the beginning. Um, just a few figures about Airbnb, we have uh, a little bit more than uh, 300,000 uh, listings on this site globally in 192 countries. Uh, about 4 million uh, travelers have used this site uh, to travel all over the world. What, what's interesting is the fact that it's actually growing even faster every time. So uh, among the 4 million uh, you, uh, travelers, 3 million were only in one year in 2012. So there is really uh, you know, an increase, uh, an exponential growth uh, that is happening in the sector right now. And I think Debbie was talking about the age of the users as well. We see that it's not only something for uh, you know, young backpackers anymore, which might have been the case at the beginning. Uh, now the average age of a host in France, for instance, is 41 years old, which is you know, not that young. Um, so, sorry for people who are above 41, I hope there is not that many. Uh, but you know, the, the, the age is actually increasing on, uh, on our user base. We have more than 15% of our hosts are, that are more than 55 years old. So it's really something that is starting to become mainstream. I think we are far from uh, plateauing, but you know, really it's, uh, uh, there, is, you know, there is something happening. It's becoming more mainstream. And when uh, our parents are starting to do it, it means that it's becoming mainstream. So. So uh, I think it's a very interesting uh, topic like uh, who are your users, what's the average age, uh, what are the limits and what is the true potential of uh, home swapping and peer-to-peer -peer accommodation. So uh, I suggest that we start to go and we go a little bit deeper in, 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 in the kind of uh, users, so you, you, you told us a, a bit about that, but like what, what are the typical users in the home swapping uh, who, who, who practice home swapping? And, and how, how do you see your uh, users in two, three years, five years? How, how has it evolved and how is it going to, to evolve in the, in the future? Magali, if you want to start, maybe. Um, it is true that uh, as exactly as Olivier has said, uh, 
the um, we have some prejudices uh, about uh, our market. I just would like to point out that there is difference between uh, renting an apartment and renting a home and a room. Uh, the homestay market um, is uh, um, defined as a, a room uh, in a family's uh, home. Uh, where you're going to um, be uh, and live with the family, whereas uh, the tourist apartment is um, that does not have really a, a framework or legislative uh, framework. Uh, you go there with some friends, and uh, so usually you don't get the same experience, and you don't uh, get the same targets either. And it is true. It is true that um, before. Uh, when I started Bedicasa, I really used uh, the platform card surfing, and uh, at that time I was young. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, I hope. <laughs> um, just just uh, some figures about card surfing because it's uh, one of the. Uh, other, million uh, yeah, members. Six million members. Six million members. It's still now. growing a it's lot, still... and they recently changed their legal structure. It became yeah. a for-profit, a big corporation, exactly. and they yeah. raised 20 million uh, euros. Uh, dollars. Sure. Yeah. And it is true that uh, when you use couch surfing, it's uh, you you go to uh, someone's place, but um, usually it's for young people. But you also have uh, elder people who use. Surfing. At Bellicasa, we have 65% uh, um, of our members who use Bellicasa as travelers uh, who uh, are between 18 and 45 years old. So it's, wide, it's really wide and uh, it's not only for young people, it's for everybody. And what I wanted to do with Bellicasa at first, I, I, the very beginning is really was really to democratize the, the uh, travel. For me, it was just unacceptable that traveling was so expensive. So I wanted to make it uh, fair, authentic, uh, and affordable for uh, everybody. And I I don't want uh, people to have prejudices. I I really would like people to change their the their look about traveling, and we're experiencing that in Bedicasa. And for um, regarding the hosts, we also have um, young people who use Bedicasa who sublet uh, their apartments because they just can't make it at the end of the month. And it's a, it's not a desire; it's really a need, and it's uh, particularly obvious in Spain. In Spain, we have. 37% of people who are unemployed, unemployed in Spain for the young people, you have 27% if I'm not uh, mistaken, uh, unemployment rate, and 37% uh, for young people. We'll, so, we'll discuss later how yeah. the economic downturn also is helping the, 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 the space, but maybe uh, Juan Juan and Debbie, uh, if you want to share some insights on, on who are your users and who they could be in the future. Sure. Um, so I think that we are targeting quite a different audience to that. Um, so we're explicitly homes, not rooms. Um, the average age of our member is 46. Um, it's generally female because women make the decisions about where families go on holiday, they make all the decisions. Um, and we skew towards families, empty nesters and second homeowners. Empty nesters is our fastest growing segment. Um, for HomeSpot, they're gold dust because they take enormously long holidays. Um, if we look at our listings, 13% of them are people listing more than one home. That's almost always the empty nesters. So how that might play out, to give an example, because we do monthly member meetups. Um, and we did one last week, so it's fresh in my mind. Um, so there's a couple, they've retired, their kids have left home, they have a flat in London, they have a house in France, they put them both on the site, and they use that to drive an adult gap year. So they do 14 consecutive swaps um, across Asia, Australia. And that kind of behavior for that segment is quite typical. So when we look at the customers that we want to acquire, currently we're 65% primary homes, 35% secondary homes. Um, secondary homes are really important. 
staffing because the availability calendar is easier to fix. So the pain with home sorting, um, as you know, is getting the dates to work. So there might be all the will in the world to swap London for Marseille, but if you can't get the dates to work, then that's um, a challenge. So a big part of the reason that we've introduced rentals as well is to allow people, particularly second homeowners, to do a bit of both. And again, based on the couple of weeks of data, that seems to be exactly what people are doing. So it's this sense in which people want flexibility in terms of how they travel. They definitely want cost saving, um, but they want to be able to do a bit of a swap and a bit of a rent. Um, and so that is what we're enabling people to do. I suppose the final point that I'd make is, um, when I launched the site, and again, everyone has their story, and my story is sort of similar to yours, which is that I've always traveled um, a lot, and then I had kids, and staying in hotels was just a horrible nightmare, and I couldn't do it anymore. And really what I wanted to do, particularly when my kids were tiny, was just to take my home and put it somewhere else. And that's how I came to HomeSwap as a category, and much like mine here as an entrepreneur, it was a pretty broken category full of lots of nasty sites that looked like Craigslist, and nothing that was a consumer experience and nothing that was a web experience or that used social or use proper community-based techniques to drive trust. Um, and that's how I came to the market. My assumption was that home shopping would be all about saving money for people. And saving money is definitely important. But the key reason why people engage with our site is because they want to live like a local, in inverted commas. And that's where community really, really matters because what they're doing when they're home swapping is life swapping to a certain extent. So they're buying into not just a home, but the amount of user-generated content that people are sharing about where they do their shopping and where the kids go to play and all of that. And that's what's driving their decisions. So the money's important, and the, and the lesson of Airbnb and house trip and everybody else is, if we're going to discuss whether this is a movement or quite what it is, it needs to have an economic reality that makes sense for people to engage with it. But I think what home swapping is doing is allowing people to travel in a different kind of way and have very different kind of travel experiences. Thank you. Francois, I know you have you also have a very inspiring story to tell, but I suggest you, you don't tell it uh, today. Uh, could you rather um, tell us, I mean, your vision of, of the motivations of the, of the people who engage in home swapping? Yeah, it, it may, share for a moment the origin of how, this, how big we think this can be. You said about 300,000 for homes or a million? Um, probably the total number of homes available for peer-to-peer -peer rentals in the world is about maybe 1 million. Home shopping can be less than 200,000. We think this can be a 100 million market. We think there can be one... So like 100 times what it is today. Exactly. And the reasoning is based on three ideas. Right now, it's basically, one is geography. That is very clear in home swapping, but it's also, I think, in, in, in rentals. It's that this is basically a Western thing. It's Western European and, uh, and North America. But it's, if you go worldwide, then the market is obviously huge and much, much larger than it is now. That would be one. The second one is the, is the way you use it. Uh, it used to be for vacations only, but when you really have liquidity and you can do it faster and uh, in a shorter time, but you can actually get a rental or a swap, then you can do it for work. Just as, an, as a point, I am here now doing a home swap. I came to Paris and I'm staying in one of, uh, of our members' places. Yeah, we, we, we met like probably 10 times all around the world and every time you swap your own. That's true. Uh, I've, been, uh, I've been traveling for we share events or sharing economy events for about a year and uh, always doing that on, uh, on swapping. So once you do not only vacations, but you do work and you do sh long and sh short term vacations, then the number of times you're going to use it is much larger. And then the third one is that um, it, right now it's also, I think, in, both in swapping, where as uh, David was saying, the, the average income probably of the people who are using it is, uh, is uh, much over average. But it's a cool thing for cool people. Once this is a normal thing for normal people, then it can be a 100 million market. We, we made some numbers. 100 million is the number of uh, homes in first and second uh, countries, first and second world countries, with income over $50,000. So they can afford to travel, and therefore they can be users of these kind of markets. 
uh, when, once we have a cultural uh, change so that uh, peer to peer accommodation is normal, then everybody will be doing it. The same thing, the same way that everybody takes a plane or everybody uh, rents a room in a hotel. So, t talking about how big uh, the market could be, the, the title of, uh, of this uh, panel is Peer to Peer Accommodation The Future of Travel. And I would like to ask you, Olivier, is it only about travel? Uh, or will people in the future uh, share their place or swap their place, as, as you said, not only for travel but for work? And, and what would be the implications of that? Uh, I know so the story of uh, Brad Chesky, the co-founder of Airbnb, is pretty famous. So he's living on Airbnb. Um, so basically, he does it not only for travel but also uh, as 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 a life. Uh, do you have other stories like that at Airbnb? And uh, is 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 travel only the, the only uh, industry? Bedicasa, uh, Airbnb, home shopping, or into? Yes, I think it's, it started with vacation, as you were saying earlier. People started to do a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, accommodation sharing, whether it's swapping or rental, uh, mostly for vacation. But this has been evolving a lot uh, since, since these times. Uh, we see that people actually use that for business. Uh, on, on the website in France, for instance, we see that 50 to 20% of the rentals are work-related. Uh, some people are using that for conferences as well, you know, uh, and it, it's actually good for the cities where this happens. If you take a, a place like Lyon in France, for instance, you have a few uh, conferences that, you know, bring a lot of people in the city, and all the accommodations, all the normal uh, accommodations are full. Some people have to travel most of the time more than 100 kilometers uh, from the site because they cannot find a place to stay. So, you know, Peer-to-peer uh, -peer accommodation like Airbnb and Vidcas and others help also uh, to uh, you know take on these peaks when there is a lot of people coming to a city, whether it's for a conference, whether it's for the uh, Festival d'Avignon, whatever the reason is. Um, and then you have people who just decide you know have different lives and uh, and w live in a, a few months uh, for a few months in a city and then for a few other months in another city. Uh, I was talking to somebody in Lyon recently. Uh, an American from San Diego, she was in Lyon for four months doing uh, baking lessons. So she was uh, going, you know, every day to bake and she was staying at somebody's place for four months. And, you know, she'll go back to San Diego afterwards, maybe go somewhere else afterwards. And really people are traveling differently, they are living differently. People don't have a nine to five job anymore. And you were talking about that in the introduction in the circus this morning. Uh, you know, there is a lot more mobility and a lot more reasons to actually use, uh, to travel and to use peer-to-peer -peer, uh, accommodation. So, of course, uh, you know, vacation is important and the one-week vacation that people take is important, but you have also long weekends, you have staycation, you have, uh, you know, people even uh, taking some vacation in their own city. We have uh, a few people doing that in Paris that actually just go from one house more to the next. Uh, just to enjoy another weekend. And they, they, they rent their place on Airbnb, they rent another one uh, on Airbnb as well, and they, you know, it's as if they had a vacation without, you know, with taking three stops on the metro line. So there are a lot of reasons why people are using it, and it's becoming even bigger. So just like uh, any booming industry, it is uh, challenging traditional uh, businesses, it is uh, challenging legal infrastructure. Uh, maybe, Maggie, if you could share, like, what's your vision of how peer-to-peer -peer accommodation might uh, need new laws, or does it need new laws, or how uh, cities should also help uh, the, the, this uh, developing uh, industry? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, when we started Bedicasa, we didn't have any um, uh, framework or legal framework. Uh, and since then, we have questions every day from our members. So we have everything on the website uh, on this, uh, the terms and conditions, and we have uh, written a, a, a a page, a web page, uh, especially for those questions, for those legal questions. Um, I, but we were receiving some letters 
from uh, from public institutions, from the city halls, and um, and it's it's always um, a fight, and it's always uh, we we are explaining to them that okay we are uh, open and we really would like to uh, collaborate with the public institutions because the truth is that for our market which is different from um, the secondary secondary homes markets and the home swap markets and I, I think um, globally speaking it's going to be uh, an issue for collaborative consumption market it's a legal framework but uh, what I mean is that uh, when um, a host when a person wants to rent his or her room if he wants to make a homestay uh, for his or her room, he has to register at the city hall as a, what we say a chambre d'hôte. It's like a guest house in, in France. The problem is that the homestay, mark, the homestay is not a chambre d'hôte. It's different. It's a room uh, that belongs to one of the children that you're going to use. Uh, so you don't have private bath bathroom, you're going to really share uh, the, your, your stay with the, the family, you're going to enter into the intimacy of the family, so it's really different. And I think it is lacking uh, in France of um, transparency, trust, um, and we, would, we really would like to collaborate with the public institution to also facilitate the administrative paperwork. And that's what we have been doing for two years now, and with some ma members of parliament who, who listen to us uh, and we, are, uh, we have handed out uh, a copy, uh, a law proposal, so we will see if um, they will uh, listen to us. So, but we are open to it, we want to collaborate and I think we all have to do that because it's in the common interest, because everybody wants to do it and uh, it's a win-win uh, collaboration. So yes, I think uh, we need to anticipate that before we get, like I know that in Airbnb in Amsterdam, they have, uh, you, you will talk about it maybe, Olivier, but uh, um, they have uh, like prohibiting the, uh, the, not the homestay, but the rental market. They, they are calling them illegal hotels. So maybe, maybe Airbnb, you could uh, share your uh, vision of uh, a necessary legal framework and, and what are your relationship with, with, with cities, not only in France, but also maybe with a global perspective? Uh, yeah, so there are a few sessions on, on public policy actually later, so I'll let uh, one of our experts who's here, Molita, and they'll talk about it later, especially the Amsterdam case if you have some questions. Uh, but, you know, one, one thing is, there is a lot of awareness to actually bring to the politicians and a lot of education to make. When we, when we are in one of these meetings with uh, you know, people from the government of the different cities, uh, people understand when you explain them why it's a good thing. And you know, every time I, I am in one of these meetings at the end, I tell them, you know, I don't have any problem looking at you in the eyes because I fundamentally think that what we're doing is good. And you know, most of them agree. Uh, if you take what exactly we're doing is we're using some resources that are otherwise unused for people who want to come travel to tourism, whatever they're doing. And people understand that. When you take the example of Paris in the beginning of August, you know, half of the city or more than that is empty. And at the same time, all the hotel rooms are booked. You know, why don't we let uh, people use their primary residences uh, and rent them out to people who are actually in need of uh, you know, accommodation for a short period of time. So both the host benefits because they make some money off an unused space otherwise, the guest benefit because otherwise we would have not come to the city, and then the local economy benefits as well because uh, you know, a lot of restaurants and uh, you know, shops and, and museums and stuff benefit economically from this, and most of the time it's actually uh, shops and restaurants from the local neighborhoods. So when you explain that to somebody and you take the time to actually do it, uh, uh, people understand and they understand that you know it's actually something good. 
does it need a legal framework so that it's a little bit more clear what's allowed and what is not and what's regulated and what's not? Sure. But fundamentally what we are doing is actually good for the, uh, the cities we're in. It's good for the planet as well. Uh, and you know that's why these discussions go actually pretty well. Let, let's get back to entrepreneurship and how you build uh, a sharing platform. Uh, it would be good to hear your, your insights about how you build a community, why community is so important, and maybe a few uh, insights also on, on your business model and how do you, you design uh, a business model that is, that is good for, for, for the community. Uh, who wants to start maybe? The, 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 Sure, so um, Juan Ho and I were talking outside about exactly this topic because for HomeSwap, there's a really interesting and salutary lesson of a business called Casa Hop, which I don't know if any of you have heard of, had heard of, past tense actually. Um, and that was launched by Paul Berry, who was the CTO of Huffington Post um, in the US, raised a lot of money, there was a lot of noise about it, um, and it didn't work. And having spent a bit of time with him talking about why it didn't work, I think that the sense for this kind of business that you can just build something that's an excellent product and expect it to be viral is just wrong. It's a nightmare building these businesses. It's a nightmare building scale out in these businesses because you're in a catch-22 situation. Without scale, why would anyone come to the site? But you need scale in order to build business. So. I think that it's hard work to get that community working and for us now, nearing 50,000 members, that's sort of scale, right? It means that we've got a reasonably um, big geographic spread. The, the downside as an entrepreneur trying to build a home swap business, which is slightly different from the peer-to-peer -peer rentals guys, is that you need to give people places where they want to go, when they want to go, and the ask can be incredibly broad. So there's no hyper-local option, really. You end up with areas of expertise, but if someone comes to the site and they want to go to Fiji and you don't have Fiji, then that's the end of their interaction with the site. So they are really difficult to build. The other thing that's really important for us as we scale is that you need to build an engaged community, because otherwise it doesn't matter how many listings you've got. The fundamental thing for a home swap or home swap and rentals business is that if people are sending outbound messages, and for us it's all about outbound messages, if you look at the metrics, so our model is free to list, pay to message, you enter a free paid trial for 14 days, you roll over three levels of membership, so it's the match.com model really. Um, unless you are receiving messages, then you don't convert, um, but therefore, if what you're scaling is a lot of listings with pretty pictures but where people don't reply to messages, that's a pain. So it's difficult. The, the difference between us and, and the peer-to-peer the -peer rentals models is that um, it, it's harder and easier. Um, the easier bit is that we're not looking to build two different businesses where you've got a guest and a host. The more complicated thing is that for someone to engage in the site, they've got to want to do both. They've got to want to go somewhere and have someone into their home and you've got to get the dates to work. So this stuff is not easy. Andrew, tell us about uh, liquidity of the marketplace. Yeah, we think that, um, this has been mentioned before, the, the key thing in peer-to-peer -peer is liquidity. Liquidity means that you have enough people in, in the marketplace, in the community, that whenever you want to interact with them, you get the value for you. That can be a rental in Airbnb, a swapping in with, with Knock, or uh, crowdfunding if you do it in, with take startup it's in any of those cases but the, um, in the home shopping industry nobody has ever been uh, big enough to arrive to this point there are no players out there apart from uh, neither of us are, are at that point in which you can assure that if you are going to join everybody is going to get their perfect change that's impossible because you need much more scale but uh, but once you get there, lots of things start to happen, and they're all positive. That's why everybody's trying to go fast and reach that scale. We, if you take into account the three different uh, options that you have to actually stay, which would be hotels, rentals, and swapping, we think that there's a trade-off between the experience that you get, the money that you pay for that, and the liquidity that you get. Basically, the more you pay, the more liquidity you get. For example, hotels have 100% liquidity. You want to rent a room, you can rent a room. There's no problem whatsoever. 
but they are the more expensive ones, and they provide the least good experience. Rent for rentals will be in the middle. It's better liquidity, not not perfect, but, be, but better than uh, swapping and worse than hotels. But it's, you still have to pay something, probably cheaper than you would be in a hotel, but much more expensive than swapping, which is free. And then in swapping is free. It's the least cost one. It's the the most difficult to get liquidity, but it's also one where you get the best experience. So cost, experience, and liquidity are very tied together. Marie, can you tell us about community and scale? Yes. Um, it is true, Debbie. Uh, it's not easy to build a community and to engage that community. Um, because uh, you have, uh, I mean, the uh, internet user had the choice to pick that website rather than this one to plan his travel and uh, to book an accommodation or, or to, to swap his home. Um, so we have um, decided, uh, so first of all, we, we raised some funds uh, and the funds is, um, in, in French we say it's the nerf de la guerre, uh, money, I don't know how to just say that in, in, in English, but it's really uh, the key factor uh, to uh, build the community because when the, you have the funds then you, ha you, you can finally hire your, your people, you can pay your salary, you can insource your technology and you can invest in, in marketing and, and communication campaigns. And that's uh, what we, we did last year. Uh, so we, um, it took us uh, five, uh, four years before uh, raising our first uh, 500 uh, uh, thousand euros. Um, and then last year we raised uh, one million and uh, we decided to invest uh, a part of it in our community in uh, developing an operation that is called the World Tour at uh, Locals and uh, so we did, we did it last year we offered two World Tour at Locals for two, two people What is the ROI of that? The? Uh, ROI, return on investment Is there a return on investment of organizing a, a World Trip? It's not uh, that obvious uh, the return on investment. It's, it's more long-term um, process because, uh, but you're not gonna gain the same thing uh, if we could uh, have decided to invest our money in uh, commercial campaigns, uh, classical ones, and we decided to um, do the other way. So the return on investment is, is not in immediate, but we now this year we we did it a second time and we have multiplied all the figures by three in just one month and we uh, have collected 200,000 uh, likes on the on the web page of the world two at the locals and we have gathered 300 200 um, 3200 um, candidates just in one month so we have multiplied by five this figure and these are not just um, classical or basic profiles. Um, a person who is going to candidate for the world tour is going to take um, half an hour to complete his or her profile with photos, articles, videos. So it's not uh, so it really engages uh, the community. And, and you're staying true to your story because this is your story, traveling the world, meeting locals, and this is how you started started Yes, yes. Um, how how does Airbnb spend its money on marketing? Like, do you? I know I know you organize a lot of uh, meetups all around the world. Uh, when, when is going when it is going to be the the, the first TV ad with Airbnb? Um, so we we basically we are not doing any marketing we don't you know the the, the way we are uh, uh, trying to meet our community and stuff for us it's not actually marketing we don't see that as a marketing investment we see that as the core of what Airbnb is and why it's actually worthwhile uh, we don't you know the, the reason why we organize meetup is actually because people want to meet each other 
So basically, all over the world, we say, okay, you guys want to meet each other, you want to meet us, why don't we book a bar, have a few tapas and a drink and a glass of wine, and we'll discuss. But this is not uh, a marketing investment. How many, okay. how many meetups every day or every week? Uh, I don't know, in France, over the uh, past uh, 50 days, we did 24. So one every two days? Yeah, basically. In France, so I don't know globally, but uh, yeah, we do we do quite a few. Um, and the reason is our base is growing very quickly. Uh, people have a lot of, of questions, you know, especially for some age groups. Uh, sometimes it's only a website when they start, and they say, okay, we want to actually see who's behind it. Uh, so the first reason why people come to our meetups is actually to meet with the staff and you know touch us to see oh there's some somebody real behind it. And then what happens most of the time is, you know, they start to talk to us, we answer their questions, and, and then they start to talk to each other. And most of them actually finish the night, you know, going to a bar together and, you know, starting their own community. So what we are doing is really starting a process that, all, that would, you know, exist otherwise. And having people, you know, spend more time together, exchange ideas, exchange tips, and for some of them become friends as well. Um, so that, that's really, uh, the community is very important for a few, few reasons. One is the key to the growth and the fact that the system works is trust. And, and basically the host needs to trust the system, the guest needs to trust the system, and both need to trust each other. And just by having uh, you know, people meet with each other, it actually helps a lot. Um, another reason why we, we spend quite a bit of time uh, with our community is uh, you know, business-wise, we're not doing that only because, you know, we like it, even if it's actually a pretty fun part of the job. It's also because most of our growth is organic. As you say, we're not doing in TV advertising. Uh, most of our growth is through word of mouth. Uh, and how do you do that? You make sure that people have good experiences, that when they have questions, you have a 24-7 customer support that can answer the questions. And then, you know, they want to talk about it to their friends and family. Uh, the example I take is when you rent your primary residence uh, or you are about to rent your primary residence, what's con going to convince you? Is it an advertising on TV or you know, advertising on the back of a bus? Or is it your best friend or your brother telling you they've been doing that for three months and they love it? Obviously, because you, you know, people put so much effect in the, in the primary residence they live in, they need somebody to convince them and that's why word of mouth is actually, is actually a good way to do it. Just one, one quick uh, comment. Uh, it's not exactly true that Airbnb doesn't have to do marketing because I get Airbnb ads in Facebook all the time. So, yeah, it's true. Uh, we're doing a little bit of online marketing, uh, but when you look at the numbers, it's very minimal on the acquisition of posts and guests. And we know you specifically, so that's why we you know, put some Facebook ads to it. Let me just uh, one quick point. One thing that I think is very relevant in peer to peer in general, but obviously in accommodation, is that we all have tried to build a product. And the product is a website in which you can do things, interact with people, find people, and everything. But from the consumer point of view, from every one of us as a consumers, the product is the community. The, the website is not, doesn't matter. What you want is to be, asked to be able to get value as a service, and the value is provided by other people. So if you don't have a good community, you don't have a good product. The best thing that can happen to a website is that nobody notices how it works. If you start thinking that, oh, this feature is cool, then it's because the, you're not going straight to the point. So we, we have three minutes left. I suggest we take two questions. So the first hand I see, you have your question. Oh, hey, you have your question. Can you, can you come here, please? Can you, can you join here to ask a question? Hi, um, I'm from Valencia and I wanted to ask you, um, for example, if you are working now with like city guides for online, for example, you and unlike, because like already like the city guides and stuff, they have a great community, and how do you work with them? It's like through the app, they send you people and they get a cut? 
I mean, I just know from your case that you work with online. You mean city guides like uh, Lonely Planet or online? What, oh, okay. Um, we, you know, we are not. Uh, Actually, Magali can uh, she has a partnership with Rotar, so she can say a little bit more. Uh, you know, obviously, we are recommended in some of the city guides uh, as a good way to get accommodation when you are in the city. Uh, but and we have a couple of partnerships here and there, but not something major. So, I don't. Do, do you want to answer on uh, Rotar? Can you just uh, develop your your thought about the city guide because we have yeah, a partnership with um, Rotar. It's like when you have, when you're, for example, in London. I mean, I know about Unlike, for example, I don't know if you know it. Um, and they have, instead of showing just the hotels, uh, you can get to the Airbnb rooms. Uh, and you can just do the whole, um, yeah, like reservation and everything through the app. So, I, I, and I think that's going to be like a more extended uh, business model for like, um, where people, where yes. we have, yeah, sure. Um, we have uh, made that partnership with Rota uh, for now two years, and we have uh, really pushed it because, uh, as we were talking about return on in investment, we don't have any return on investment. I mean, it's not immediate with Rota, but uh, in, in the community is the same. It uh, the community shares the same values. And uh, the community of La Huta, the, this city, French city guide, is looking for alternative ways to travel. Um, that community doesn't want to uh, travel um, and to, to find the same uh, meal as, uh, as they, they, they have at, in their country. They want to travel off the beaten track. They want to break their habits. They really want to live uh, uh, their travel and they want to refuse to be considered as a product of mass consumption. Uh, so that's why we have, uh, um, we, we think that this partnership is really um, meaningful. And uh, I think this community is looking for an environment, an alternative environment to, um, to switch their life, to really live something different. Okay, last question. So the question, yeah, yeah, the question is around. So in, in, in Germany, especially the uh, the operating tours are actually pretty powerful when they provide some package travel. Uh, how are we disrupting this specific industry? Um, I, I think yeah, package travel is not necessarily growing as fast as it used to. In some countries, it's actually decreasing. Uh, one of the reasons is people actually want to build their own travel themselves. So if you look at statistics in France, for instance, 84% of people actually prepare or book their travel online. And most of them, uh, on average, they actually look at seven or eight websites. Meaning that people are not going to a travel agent necessarily, uh, not, not all of them are going to a travel agent and say, hey, I want to go to Bali, can you package me something? Many people want to do that themselves, meaning that they book their flight alone, and then they book their accommodation, and they do different accommodation, and then they book what they're going to do on uh, when they are there. Uh, so it's just a, a way, you know, people consume travel going forward. 
uh, they want to have more of a say in building their own uh, their own travel and peer-to-peer -peer accommodation is one of them but you can see a lot of different ways people actually want to take more ownership of the planning uh, even in terms of you know uh, plane tickets people don't want to uh, just go to an airline anymore that we use websites like Darjeeling for instance that can help you find cheaper tickets and stuff. So they really are more involved in how they build it. They look at many different websites and obviously uh, internet helps a lot because they have everything at their fingertips. Uh, uh, I just would like to add something. I think the, the key words here it's uh, disintermediation and customization. Um, people are are going to go directly to uh, their peers and they're going to use uh, our community platforms to interact directly. They, they, their choice, uh, it's 90% of their choice is depending on the reviews they see on the internet. Then it's the price at 80% and then the destination. So we see that community is the key factor for, uh, our, uh, for the vision of the travel. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for those of you who wanted to ask questions, but now you have the speakers, so you can ask your questions directly. Uh, thank you so much to you four, and um, and have a good time uh, those, those three days. Thank you so much.